Welcome back to the Pomerantz Mentor Vignette Series, where we're continuing our discussion of a challenging and scary subject, uh, shoulder instability and the labrum. Let's uh, get right to the first scary story, the axillary reflection, the danger zone. What's dangerous about it? Young practitioners often overread lesions that are present here because in large performance athletes, the ligament can be pretty large. It can look like a tumor. It can look like it's injured or swollen. Conversely, because of the variations that are present here, young, inexperienced practitioners will often miss pathology that is present or localized to this region. Now, the, the inferior aspect of the glenoid cavity is supported by a hammock. And that hammock is the axillary band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. There are three basic bands, an anterior, a middle or axillary, and a posterior. While the axillary band is a hammock, and you think of a hammock as something curved, and it is curved when you bring your arm out, when your arm is at the side, it's folded like a V. So you'll see two arms of a hypo-intense V of variable thickness with a thin slit in between or perhaps a small amount of very bright fluid signal intensity, but it too should be scant or a slit. As mentioned, the ligament size varies with the age, the sex, and the activity of the patient. A 250-pound man who throws a baseball is going to have a much larger axillary ligament than a 115 pound gymnast who is a female or girl. It is common, in fact it is the most common site in our experience for inflammatory, non-fluid like yet hyper intense adhesive capsulitis or dry capsulitis without an effusion to accumulate in this axillary fold and widen it. It may also engulf the ligament. So instead of the ligament being two black lines in a V, now they are ill-defined, gray, smudgy structures with, between the two of them, a gray pseudotumorous mass, the adhesive capsulitis. As you know, adhesive capsulitis occurs with some moderate or minor remote trauma that is most commonly seen in the left arm of middle-aged women, but it can occur in anybody. In the axillary space, there may be a little undercutting and transition between hyaline and fibrocartilage, but you should not see clefts or fissures or sulci below the equator of the humeral head and the glenoid that medialize and come out the medial side of the axillary labrum. You should never see any cysts that are under pressure. When I say under pressure, I mean cysts that are expanding, producing mass effect. In throwing athletes, the axillary capsule, and in particular, the posterior capsule or posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament are often billowing out and distended to allow for greater ranges of motion. The axillary labrum should have a proper axis. What is that axis? Well, let's assume that my fist is the humeral head and my fingers are the glenoid. The glenoid should fit over the humeral head in such a fashion. So if one looks at the axis of the inferior labroligamentous complex, it is slightly angled from medial superior to lateral inferior. It curves in a little bit to hold the humeral head in place. If it looks more like this, it's going to be insufficient. If it's associated with a giant spur that comes down, then it may restrict the abduction of the shoulder. This giant spur is called 
the goat beard deformity. We'll talk more about the configurations of the axillary bony labrum at a later date. Here are some anatomic drawings to help you further understand the relationship between the various structures, the ligament, the bony labrum, the hyaline cartilage, and the fibrocartilage. On top, on the viewer's left, we have a ligamentous structure in green, the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Its attachment, origin, and takeoff from the glenoid varies greatly with the axis or the portion of the glenoid that we're addressing. So that's not my purpose today, to show you how it takes off, because the takeoff is going to be different in different quadrants. But I want to emphasize that there are multiple components to the gleno labro ligamentous stability relationship and the humeral head. And they include ligament, bone, hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, which means that any one of them can fail. All four of them can fail. So you can have lesions that are single, double, triple, even quadruple if all four components are involved. Another caveat, in some portions of the glenoid, one or more of the components can be missing. There are portions of the glenoid where the ligament is completely deficient. We see this in some variations, one variation called the Buford complex. Here we have a variation where there's no labrum. The yellow area is absent. It can be absent because it's torn and displaced to another location, but in this example, it's developmentally absent, and that's most common where? In the upper anterior quadrant of the shoulder, where the greatest variations exist in terms of scope and frequency. Now let's go down to the lower row. And beautifully depicted, one through six, are some, just some, not all, of the variations you're going to find here. A well-developed pointed labrum, a rounded edged labrum, a hooked labrum, an absent labrum, number four, very common. Number five, a cleaved labrum with some small, subtle serrations along its medial border. And then a blunted, flat, stubby labrum. All potentially normal. Here's an example of the axillary labrum looking very abnormal. Now, one thing I'd like to highlight for you is when I'm assessing glenohumeral instability, I begin my exam always with non-contrast imaging. I never start with an arthrogram. And I only finish with an arthrogram less than 10 or 5% of the time. It is uncommonly necessary when you are assessing the characteristics of macro instability when you reach a certain level of expertise. Here is an example of a proper axis of the labral ligamentous complex. There is a large area of high signal intensity on this water weighted sequence with a curious septum and signal inside the ligament. The labrum is a little bit forced up or superiorly because the person doing the examination accidentally injected directly into the labrum. Another reason why arthrography is not the first diagnostic algorithm of choice. It can actually complicate the situation and make interpretation more difficult, especially at the expert level. The operator also extravasated contrast into the soft tissues simulating edema and swelling or even perhaps the misperception of periosteal elevation. So this was completely 
an iatrogenic axillary labroligamentous injection. Here's another example of the axillary space. This patient has a large labroligamentous complex with a large labrum. And the labrum has several leaves to it, several layers to it. This is the glenoid half. This is the humeral fold or half. This is the slit that we were talking about before. This slit is just a little more conspicuous, but I wanted it to be highlighted so you can see that it is indeed very linear, very well defined, very etched just a little more conspicuous because this shoulder is inflamed. There's some inflammation superiorly. It's inflamed as a result of a reaction to the prior placement of an iatrogenic tack. But that inflammation affords us the ability to see one side and the other side of the axillary fold. Now what is all this tissue? It is a poorly defined transition between the medial fold of the axillary band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the labrum. Remember we said that the transition, when we introduced some of the anatomic concepts in the last vignette, the transition is very ill-defined in some patients. Finally, there is a small fissure right here between the labroligamentous complex and the glenoid cup. That fissure doesn't belong. It's not a symptomatic fissure, but that fissure is not allowed to come out the medial side. This fissure represents a site of prior, slightly inflamed, yet solid repair. So it is not a normal, virgin, unoperated shoulder, nor was this linear area symptomatic, but it is an example of what I call clefted medialization in the lower quadrant of the glenoid cup. Now, which, which clefts are normal? We just established that golden rule number one for this vignette, in the inferior quadrant, Clefts are not allowed to come out the medial side. We're going to have now golden rule number two. In golden rule number two, as you course from anterior to posterior, any clefts or signals that you see should dissipate when you get into the posterior quadrant or behind the takeoff of the biceps anchor complex. If these clefts or fissures become more conspicuous or break out the top or associated with cysts, they are always abnormal, even without the cyst. It doesn't mean they're symptomatic, but when you get into the posterior quadrant, the number of variants and clefts and sulci substantially diminish, virtually to zero. So the posterior quadrant is a secure, consistent place anatomically. Here we have a signal in the mid-coronal plane that persists into the posterior quadrant. It's abnormal. It's a type of superior labral tear, anterior to posterior, or slap lesion, whose categorization is a story for another day. Golden rule number two. Now, golden rule number one is very subtly violated here as well. This signal by itself would be non-contentious. But the fact that you see some very subtle signal going medially suggests that there has been an old injury here that has closed off. You can even see a vestige of it right there. Most likely, this patient is a weightlifter, and we can see evidence of that from the muscularity and the lack of fat in the deep tissues. And weightlifting is one of the most common causes for this appearance. So now we have golden rules number one. 
no medialization in the inferior quadrant. Golden rule number two, signals and clefts superiorly should dissipate or diminish in the posterior quadrant or when you get behind the biceps labral anchor. Golden rule number three. The superior and inferior, as well as the anterior and posterior labrum, should have the appearance of a goblet. And the humeral head should be viewed as a round tennis ball that sits inside this goblet. Let's draw the goblet for you. This is our goblet. This is the center of our goblet. Actually, this is the tennis ball that fits inside the goblet. The tennis ball has 360 degrees. The superior labrum and the inferior fibrocartilaginous labrum should hug the goblet and have a conformity to the slope of the goblet. So the slope of the goblet is about here, sorry, should hug the conformity of the slope of the tennis ball. So the tennis ball is here, and there should be a labrum that wraps right around it with the same orientation. But there isn't. Let's get our eraser out and see what is there. Nothing. The bony labrum. The bony labrum ends right about here. Let's see if we can show it a little better. The bony labrum ends here. There is no fibrocartilaginous labrum. Where'd it go? It's over here. It's ripped off. It's floating in a sea of inflammatory tissue. And what's around it? Blood and the torn capsule. Let me erase my mark so you can see it. The blood is gray and the torn capsule represents a linear structure represents a linear structure that courses around this gray tissue. There is the inferior glenohumeral ligament. There's a piece of the glenohumeral ligament. There's the rest of the glenohumeral ligament stripped away. And although difficult to appreciate, this is all delaminated periosteum. But golden rule number three, the labrum, which should have hugged the neck of the humerus, the bottom of the tennis ball, is now displaced off its axis. So you have three golden rules. Let's summarize them one more time. No medialization in the inferior quadrant. Superior labral signals, clefts and sulci, should diminish as you go from anterior to posterior. There should be good congruity such that the fibrous labrum, both superiorly and inferiorly, in the mid-coronal plane, should wrap their arms around the tennis ball of the humeral head. Finally, golden rule number four, the last one. The position of the humeral head should be centered relative to the glenoid cup. We can determine that one of two ways. We can either do it by looking at the center of the humeral head and making sure that it's centered with the bare area and middle of the glenoid. If the humeral head is elevated, then we say it's decentered. This happens when you have rotator cuff insufficiency. Another way to evaluate it is with something called the scapulo humeral line. And that is usually made with this little step off here. So there's a very subtle minor elevation in this case of the scapulo humeral line or of the humerus relative to the glenoid cup. And we have a good reason for that. What is that reason? We've lost the inferior capsule and the inferior labrum which helps keep the humeral head down. So there's very slight upward floating of the humeral head. Golden rule number four, 
the relationship of the humeral head should be centered to the glenoid cup in the mid-coronal plane, a sign that can be determined by the central position of the acetabulum relative to the cup, there's the, sorry, of the acetabulum relative to the humeral head and the scapulohumeral line. That concludes our vignette, our mentor series vignette on macro instability in the labrum where we have focused on the axillary labrum for the entire time frame. Thank you and have a great day.